Well, praise the Lord. I feel like yelling, shouting. The presence of God is so strong here. I always feel uh, tremendously conscious about the Holy Spirit being here. And then we so glibly talk about him and you almost can see him go, yeah, that's okay, but you'll learn. Not quite, but you're getting there. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. Thank God for his mercy and his patience and his love. Just to think that when you came here, as we were worshiping, when you came here, the Holy Spirit is in you. You know, for years, I'm just going to meander a bit. For years, we said, Holy Spirit, please be here, like he's a bad church attender. He's here. He's here. You're the temple. The temple didn't come here on its own. He's here. And that, that sounds like such a just a, sort of a Christianese statement, but I just feel like I want it to be a, more of a reality to me than ever before. Because I think we rush through things. I'm not talking about, you know, worship and stuff. I'm just saying in our whole life, we're, we're so filled with appointments and rushing and rushing. And he's so faithful to wait for our attention to his guidance and to his leading. Amen? So I feel that very strongly tonight. And as we just kind of engage and are open... He'll, he'll do that. Pastor preached, Pastor Johnny preached on Sunday. The topic I want to go on Wednesdays and even use the text I was going to use today out of this entire scripture for two guys to end up using the same text. How many know is the same Holy Spirit? And that God is actually really emphasizing something and talking to us. Now, I don't, I don't, there's so, you know, I've been a Christian all my life and I heard so much Christianese, yes, God is talking. Wow, stop your horses. God of heaven talking to us tonight, to our lives, what he's doing, what he's, where he's going. So I hope, None of my stuff here is a sermon. I hope that somewhere in the maze of my notes and my talking, the Holy Spirit personally talks to you. I think a lot of times what I feel is the Holy Spirit says, you go ahead, talk. And while you're talking, I'll do my talking to my people. Amen. So it just got your attention here to talk and the Holy Spirit's talking to you. It's just so rich. The worship tonight, so rich. Hallelujah. I don't know, but I just felt like, I felt like I heard God singing tonight. Zephaniah says that God sings. God sings. We've heard all of us sing. But to hear God sing. And what does he sing about? Read in the Bible. He sings about you. He sings about his vineyard. He sings about his bride. You know, we got this austere thing about God. True love, true intimacy, and divine romance originates with God. Sure, it's been messed up by humans. But just because it's messed up, we don't just leave it messed up. We clean it up. I just, just have to tell you that God, God is singing over his church tonight. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I, wanna, I, wanna, I just want to tune in. I heard heaven sing. I had an experience where I heard heaven sing. Literally saw, saw the worship and saw and heard the singing. I want to also hear God say to his church, And as you read the Bible, you'll find out he does. So, Pastor Johnny, you were on fire on Sunday. 
The reason you were on fire, you were delivering live coals from the altar. And I, I was just, I was so blessed, so blessed and received so much. So thank you for hearing from God and these particular times. It's no easy for it, not easy for any pastor. A lot of pastors have quit. A lot of pastors have just pulled away. But we're not those that pull away. Amen. Pastor John, he said, we're coming back in the power of the Spirit. We are coming back in the power of the Holy Ghost. I know you heard it, but I want some forces to hear that. Because you see, the devil left the, left the wilderness because he couldn't win. So he left the wilderness and he started messing around with people. And the Bible says, and Jesus came in the power of the Spirit and started cleaning house, casting devils out, healing the sick. And, and doing all that stuff. So it's not just the wilderness. We'll come out of the wilderness. The devil will leave the wilderness before we do because of the presence of God and the word, word of the Lord. And then we leave in the power of the Spirit to bring healing. We, uh, my wife and I um, are on the phone a lot. And just knowing who we're on the phone with and what some people are going through, it, it just really... I'll, I'll, let me just talk. It just, I, am, I am so moved to go beyond where we're at. Not criticizing where we're at. Because if we're going to move forward, we can't criticize on our past. If we criticize the past, that's going to get us stuck there. So often you hear preachers, we're dead. We're not moving in God. Bless God. We're going to move in God. Well, go ahead, buddy. Move in God. God, is, Jesus is building his church. Yes. And, and we're moving from a positive to a greater positive. Not from a negative to a positive. So much of our preaching is moving from a negative. And we, there's times we move from our negative to a positive. And then once we start moving in God, in the glory of God, we move from glory to glory. We don't stop at one level of glory. This is what this church has been about. I, I, I know there are pastors who just let the sheep lay down and chew their cud beside still waters. This is not the kind of pastor you had. He goes, okay, a couple minutes you lay down, come on, let's move on. There's greater pastures ahead. I know that, but that's the motor that's in me. That's the prophetic wheel that's in me. That, that, that when we see the sick and we see cancers, and we see people dying from it. I don't want to lay down in the pasture while people are dying. I want to move in a dimension that the Bible speaks about, of how Jesus moved. Now remember, we know so clearly that we were made in his image and in his likeness. That's one dimension. The greater dimension is we were born in his image and likeness. That is irreversible. What's made might be tempered with. But the fact that I'm born from my mom and dad, you can't change that and I can't change that. Now where I'm going with that is, so if we have been made and born in the image and likeness of God, don't just go, yeah, I heard that scripture that's in Genesis. Stop and pretend you never heard it. So if God made us in his image and his likeness, did he actually make us in his image and likeness? Did he make us in his image and likeness almost? Now, this is what God's saying to me. I'm just going to tell you what God's saying to me. I preach on that all the time, but it's in the back of your mind say, well, you know, more or less, you know, because I'm not God. Well, that's easy. That's an easy revelation. But if he made us, and he did, in his image and likeness, then we are made exactly like him. Now, this is going to take transition. This is going to take um, a mind change and a mindset because 
a lot of Christendom is like, yeah, we're made in his likeness and image. Not totally sure what that means, but you know, we just got to tolerate things in life. After all, I, I listen to some of these on TV and they talk about, well, you know, there are things we don't know why they don't happen and we just, we just have to learn how to tolerate. I don't want to tolerate nothing. I want it to frustrate me, not tolerate it. How many are hearing me? I want, it to, I want it to disturb me enough to get me out of my religious recliner and say there's got to be more. This can't be the way it is. Can't be. Can't be. Do I know what to do? No, but I know I should do something. And I'm not going to sit on my religious back end and just say, well, you know, not everybody gets healed. You know, oh, they're healed now that they died. They're healed, went to heaven. See, I don't believe that. Why can't they die 100% healthy? My mom passed away on Mother's Day. And our prayer as kids, and we just prayed that way, said, don't let her suffer any more than she did with eight kids. Just, just give her peace. She didn't die of any sickness, no disease. She didn't even struggle breathing. One, one out percent just took calmly the last breath, went to be with the Lord. I'm not against death. I'm not against when God wants to take us home. I just don't want sickness to be the vehicle. When Elijah went up to heaven, God didn't send a diseased vehicle to take him up disease chariot. God sent a chariot from heaven. And so there's a lot of things, church, and those that are listening online that we have just accepted. We just, that's just the way it is. And slowly but surely, it degenerates where there's hardly a difference between the world and between us. That was a good place to say amen. We, there's got to be a dramatic distinction, and that's where my heart's going. So I've been studying about the new covenant, and honestly, truthfully, it's like I'm being a Christian all over again. I don't know if you've had that experience. I don't mind admitting it. It's like... Andrew, where have you been all this time? Look, look, at, look at the glory and the power and the majesty of the new covenant that totally transcends intellectual comprehension. Totally. Revelation doesn't require intelligence. But intelligence requires revelation. How many heard that? Intelligence requires revelation. Revelation does not require intelligence. And my feeling is when I listen around the country that we become so intelligent about the things of God and we process everything through our brain comprehension. The problem is what does not transform has only been an intellectual thing. You know, you could talk to an alcoholic about how bad alcohol is. How many know that doesn't change him? Talk to a drug addict how bad drugs are. That doesn't change him. We worked with that for, for years. Kids came in high on drugs. By the time worship was done, they were delivered. They were delivered. We had drugs on the carpet Evelyn had to keep the kids off the floor because you never knew what they would pick up and pills and all kinds of stuff. But in worship, and you have to hear this, in worship is when transformation occurred. And worship is not intellectual. Worship is a sphere that transcends intellectualism. And that's why some people go, oh, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, I'll calculate, praise the Lord, say 10 times, praise the Lord, say five times, hallelujah. This, that ain't going to work. Nothing will happen in your life. 
All right, so I'm just kind of bearing my soul. Where am I going with this? I believe that in these, an era is emerging where the fullness of what the new covenant is and what Jesus came to do is going to be unveiled. That which has been concealed through the ages will be revealed whenever that last age is will be revealed in full completion. That just makes sense, doesn't it? The reason it could not be revealed in one era or one age because it's so dramatically major and so big that one age, one era, one, one sphere does not have enough time nor capacity to grab the fullness. We are an extremely privileged people to be in this generation. Because for generations, God, by different times and seasons, Hebrew says, has revealed himself in progressive portions of, of his glory and his might. And all those progressive portions are being accumulated into the last day, just like interest compounded in the last day. We don't want to miss this. The reason I'm saying that is because it's going to happen anyway. God is doing it anyway. God's not going to wait on me and say, well, you know, Andrew's a little bit behind. I better wait for my emerging my glory and emerging my power and emerging the fullness of revelation. Oh, no. Jesus is building his church, and I must yield and cooperate to the building of his church. I don't initiate the building. He is the builder. The Holy Spirit is that river that's perpetually flowing it doesn't flow when I realize there's a river. It doesn't flow when I kind of get in shape. No, when I get in shape, that means I have learned how to dip in the river, how to tap into the flow of God. We often, years ago, prayed, God, please move in this service. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine? I, I, you know, I think we meant well, but it was really sideways. When did God quit moving? When did God quit living? This is when we come to church like this and we worship. It's not to let's uh, let's get the worship really pumped up to see God moving. Oh no! What happens? We get pumped up to tap into the move of God, to tap into the the pulse of what God is doing. That's why worship in this house is so vital, because we don't worship to make God move. We worship because God is moving. God is moving. Never quit. Never quit. These are some of the most revolutionary truths and insights that need to revolutionize the church. You know why you want to pray sometimes? Not because your flesh wants to pray. It's because God is moving you to prayer. Often I hear people say, you know, if we pray and we seek the Lord and we cry out to the Lord, God will give us a revival. That's not why we're crying out. I know I'll be disagreed with this, but that's perfectly fine. You'll still get to heaven when you disagree with me. The reason prayer starts happening and people start praying because the Spirit of God is stirring our hearts to position ourselves for the move of God that's happening. Since when can a human make God move? Why would a human need to make God move? God is moving. I think that so often, I'll make this statement, and I understand what it means to wait on God. I know there's that scripture, and I know what it means, and I Greeked it out and Hebrewed it out, and it's wonderful, but I think by and large, God is patiently waiting on us. God's patiently waiting on us to position ourselves and come, there's a word I'm looking for, come into harmony with God. 
There's still a word I'm looking for, but that's okay. It'll come sooner or later. And these days, some words come like three days later when you don't need them. Align ourselves with God. Prayer doesn't make God move. It aligns us with the move of God. Praise aligns us with the move of God. Praise repositions us from from our world to his world that's living, pulsating, perpetually alive. In his world, healing is happening. Healing in his world is not an event, not an incident, but a perpetual existence, a perpetual habitation. In the new covenant, we're no more in the visitations of God. We're in the habitation of God. God inhabits. The word inhabit means that's where he decided to come and dwell forever. Zion is his place, church, where he decided to come and dwell forever. When you're having visitations, it's because God is still not dwelling in that dimension in your life and wants to introduce himself in that dimension so that dimension becomes a perpetual habitation and not a visitation, not an incident, not an event, but a living place. Come on, church. Is that God speaking to us? God speaking to us. So when, when we come to worship here, we don't wait for the third chorus to kick in. We're already kicked in. We come to assemble ourselves. We've, we, we come as worshipers to worship and multiply the power of worship in the corporate setting. You know, this... There's a real attack on the corporate setting by various things, and I'm not going to go into that. Is a soldier an army? Is one piece of board a house? So those that feel they don't have to be in the corporate, that's fine. You're a soldier, but you're not an army. You're not an army. You're one piece, but you're not the building. My arm is not my body. My arm is only useful when it stays a part of the body. I've, I've listened. I've, we've had, in the early 70s, God gave an extremely dynamic revelation about what the local church is and the corporate body of Christ. Of course, whatever Satan is attacking is what's threatening him. And what's threatening him right now is the corporateness of the body of Christ. Look around. What have we just come through? Hello. Oh, yeah. It looks really intellectually reasonable. But the bottom line is to corral the church and suppress the church. I say to Satan, good luck. Because you're going to need it. All over the world, the church is going to come together more powerful than it ever, ever has. So where am I going with this? I want to talk about the new covenant. I want to talk about the new covenant. It took God 4,000 years to prepare the cutting of the new covenant and many more years after that, to establish its greatness. 4,000 years for God to prepare in types and shadows and symbols and allegories year after year, year after year. Sad part is his people missed it anyway. (laughs) Because God said to them, if you would have known Moses, If you would have known Moses, if you would have known what I was doing through Moses, that was your identification grid. But you messed up Moses. You messed up the law. 
You messed, you messed up the types and shadows and you brought six sacrifices in. You brought the lame, the blind, the halt and you put that on my altar and your altars have been polluted and scattered. So when Jesus came, you had no means by which to identify the Messiah. Let me tell you something. It's really critical to know what God has done in the movement of restoration and his revivals of the past and to embrace them instead of being critical. Yes, they may have come, become dead organizations, but one day they were not dead. They may have become dead denominations, maybe, but one day they weren't. So could we look beyond the death and could we look beyond what has been degenerated and see what God intended originally and embrace that and understand that and then be able to identify what God is doing today? The same way God talked about Moses. Major advancement of revelation truth in this emerging era. Major advancement. advancement. Every era was an advancement. How many, how many understand that? Okay, you really understand that? that? That yesterday's revelation is the foundation for today's revelation. And if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Except go back and believe for a revival. I know there's one point a lot of pastors kind of go to me. I don't say, you don't believe in a revival? Yeah, if you're dead, you need one. If you're alive, you don't need a revival. You don't revive live people. Hello? You revive dead people. You revive something that's dead. So I don't want to die because I don't, want, I, I don't want a revival because that means I died. And I have to be revived. A refreshing because I went stale. A renewal because everything went old. A restoration because I lost what I should have kept. Come on, church. And so we're on this treadmill. We're waiting for a revival. We're believing God for a revival. Probably necessary, but if we stayed alive, it wouldn't have been necessary. We'd have just moved from one glory to the next. Instead of we're reviving what happened way back there because we lost it. I'm giving you prophetic insight. You appreciate that? And for your personal life, for your personal life, don't lose what you're supposed to use because it'll die. And before you go on, you're going to have to have it revived and renewed and refreshed. And you're going to have to come every Sunday and get all cranked up again. I wonder if we could stay cranked up all week. What would our Sunday look like? When we walk through that door, and we've already moved, we're moving from the glory we're in to another level of glory, another level of faith. Eventually, wouldn't be tonight, apparently, looking at the clock. I want to talk about atmosphere. The absolute criticalness of the, of the atmosphere of the house of God atmosphere in your life for God to work. And I'll show you, I will go through scripture and I'll show you that God does not perform in a negative atmosphere. Negative atmosphere, all God does is by his mercy sustain us. So in this house for years and years without maybe verbalizing it that way, Lynn and others that have been here for a long time, there was an atmosphere. There was an atmosphere of expectancy. Expectancy. Walk in and Holy Ghost is here. What is he going to do? You, sub, you put the program over here just in case God wants to use it. I'm not against programs. I'm against programs guiding the Holy Spirit. An expectancy. You see, in Ephesians, 
I'm not going to go into all that because if I open that page, I need another couple hours. But the book of Ephesians, God gave through Paul such an extremely dynamic, massive, majestic, elaborate revelation of who we are in Jesus Christ. Elaborate. We're not weak sinners. After we got saved, nowhere in Scripture does God call us sinners. He calls us saints. All the epistles are written to the saints, so if you're a sinner, don't read it. It's addressed to the saints. So when I look at who God made us, which all is... um, uh, in the image and likeness of God. And then Paul, by revelation, unpacks that image and likeness of God as to who we are. So much so that when God created Adam in his likeness and image, on the sixth day, God rested from his labors Because man was supposed to keep doing what God started. Oh, come on, church. Come on, church. God said, I made you in my image and my likeness. Run the world. Not some little department, not a little devotional. Run the world. We were supposed to run the world. Never were the heathen supposed to run the world. Never. But we tolerated it. We now have, have got that concept. Here's, here's a system and the government going in left field with all kinds of values and laws and rules. And we're here with a little banner saying, please don't kill babies, please don't kill babies. We should be in Ottawa making that decision. I thought I'd get more amens than that. So for, to preach about this covenant and to preach about the dynamics of this covenant, which absolutely requires revelation... It's not information, it's revelation. Then it requires an attitude of I want more from God. I'm anticipating more, I'm expecting more. So you see the book of Ephesians, he gives you at least over a hundred, over a hundred things in six chapters of who we are. Over a hundred things that are all interwoven. And when those hundred things multiply themselves with one another, it's eternity. It's eternity. Hallelujah. Then in the book of Ephesians, he says, now that I showed you who you are, this will not happen except what Pastor Johnny preached about in verse 17, 15, 17, and so forth, that he said to the Ephesians, you need revelation. Well, you just told me who I am. Why do I need revelation? Because that's information. That's not revelation yet. Revelation is when it becomes a living reality to you. You see, how do I know it's a living reality? It transforms you. It impassions you. It moves you. It inspires you. It changes your priorities. You don't decide, am I coming to church on Sunday or not? Then you don't have revelation yet. You just have information. It drives you. It propels you. But in, in, in the rest of the chapters... He says, okay, this is the atmosphere that's required for that information to become a living revelation, which is, by the way, totally massive for who you are. I look at you, and you're looking at me. 
we feel so human, don't we? But Christianity, the miracle of Christianity is divinity entering humanity. The humanness. Messiah, Jesus, was God. Where? God in the, say it, in the flesh. No, you're not going to become an angelic bird with six wings before God's going to work through you. He's going to work through you now as a human being. That's the miracle of God. And that's where I want to go. Will you come? Will you pray? Will we worship? Will we praise? Will we honor God? Will, will, will we do? You say, uh, yeah, there's things you have to clean up in our lives. Not for the sake of cleaning up, but for the sake of, of creating an atmosphere. I'll prove to you that Jesus himself cannot do miracles in a negative atmosphere. We say, why aren't more miracles happening? Not up to Jesus. Not up to Jesus. It's clean up on things like bitterness, forgiveness, all that stuff. You say, well, I, I don't feel like I need to forgive. Well, stay where you are. But don't complain. Complaining, murmuring, disagreeing, family life. You know, the success of a home and marriage has all to do with atmosphere. How many know that any one of us, I can come into my house, I haven't tried it yet, because I don't want to sleep on the love seat. I could come into my house and say one thing and change the whole atmosphere into a negative atmosphere. Or if, if I even don't agree with everything, I have a higher reason why I have to be patient and kind because I don't want to lose the sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. I don't want to lose that atmosphere. 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 When we come into this house, I'm not going to tell you what to do, what not to do. I'm just going to pray right away that we all learn how to be contributors to the atmosphere and not consumers of the atmosphere. Thank you, Lord. Heaven didn't tolerate rebellion for one bit. Lucifer contradicted and compromised the atmosphere of heaven and God evicted him. Yet we tolerate with so much nonsense in the church. We adjust, we compromise, we put up with, and then we wonder why the Holy Spirit is quenched and resisted. Are you, are you with me tonight? This is changing. Hallelujah. Can we all stand together, please? Holy Spirit of God. Holy Spirit of God. Teach me and make me aware that you're there all the time. Not just in church, not just when I'm on my knees. But you're there all the time. And that it's become my responsibility to create a place for you where you can work. To give you the room, to give you the privilege, the honor, the, your desire to work in my life. I'd rather take it wrong and stay sensitive. I don't have to be right. I really don't care. But if I can only be sensitive to the Holy Spirit, not become hard and calloused and determined in my opinion. No, that's not the atmosphere. Thank you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, Jesus. 
Holy Spirit of Jesus. Not tomorrow, but right now, Lord. <sighs> Adjust things in all of our hearts and our spirit. There's things we have to let go and things we need to hang on to better. Teach us how to do it, Lord. The world is dying. The world's confused. The world's a mess. That's not being negative. That's reality. That's the world you died for. People are dying of cancer, and they shouldn't be. Lives taken too early, way too early with sickness and disease. Lord Jesus Christ, in these days that are before us, all that is changing. All that is changing, church. We'll not be in such a rush. We will listen to you, Holy Spirit. But we'll wait in the upper room, not be like the 380 that got impatient and took off. Count us in as the 120 that are waiting for the mighty rushing wind. Why was the mighty rushing wind? Holy Spirit was so anxious to inhabit his people with love and grace, power and truth. Thank you, Father. Thank you for this evening. Hallelujah, bless the name of the Lord. Blessed be thy holy name, O Lord. Mighty and majestic are you, Lord. We love you tonight. Glorious is thy Holy Spirit here. Oh, Holy Spirit, we adore you. Holy Spirit, we embrace thy ways, O oh Lord. Beautify your house with your glory. The people know your glory abided in your house. It's not an incident, not an event, but a habitation. Not only a healing, but health. A constant existing, even like heaven. Let thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Andrew. Thank you for that revelation word. Let's pray for this Sunday. This Sunday, Pastor John's going to be preaching, and he's going to be preaching on. Be yeah, yeah. He has a word on becoming free. And this isn't just a sermon for Sunday. This is the power of God to set his people free. And he has already done all the work to set people free. And yet many are still living and believing that they're not. And so I, I want us to see a massive, massive, I, like not deliverance, maybe deliverance is the right word, but because fear is a spirit too. And we want to see people get set free from their past and free from fear and free from anything that the enemy's been tying them up with. So pray with us for this Sunday. Just call on the Lord. Every time it comes to your mind between now and Sunday, call out to the Lord. We want to see a supernatural miracle this Sunday in Jesus' name. And uh, if I can ask you to pray for one more thing for us too. This Friday, um, I'll be on a conference call with... Um, our premier and Dr. Bonnie Henry, along with many other faith leaders. And uh, and I, I just want to believe that things are going to open up and that they're going to be influenced by the Spirit of God in the decisions that they make over this province. And we need the churches to be activated and released to do the work the way that we can do it best. I mean, we can find ways to creatively do it, but... Let's let, let's let it happen the way it happens best. And so, 
So pray with us for that too. This is, this is going to be a pivotal week for sure. For Motion Church and for our province in Jesus' name. And uh, yeah, lots of things happening. And just pray for us too as we work together with the other churches on, uh, on a real healing response to what happened here in our city. And, um, and so we're going to see God do supernatural things in these days. So, Father, we just lift it up to you right now, God. You know all the things. You had the plans together before we came up with anything. So we give it back to you, God. And, Lord, we submit ourselves to what you're doing. And, Lord, we're believing this Sunday to see the miraculous power that you gave us, that you've already paid for, at work in your people, discovering what it means to really be forgiven and free. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We love you and love being your pastors. <laughs> love, love, love what God is doing. And uh, we're going to see even greater days coming up now. This is going to be explosive in Jesus' name.